Welcome to my new series on the mathematics of money. My goal with this series is to break down the actual underlying mathematics to do with concepts in money because as a math professor, I find that when we actually break down the formulas and try to understand deeply what's going on, it helps us build our understanding and our intuition. And perhaps nowhere is this more important than when it comes to money. Every episode, we're gonna look at a different concept related to money, personal finance, investing, economics. And in this episode, we're gonna focus on interest. Interest is perhaps the most foundational concept to do with money. And we're gonna look specifically at simple interest, compounded interest, and continuously compounded interest. So why is there interest in the first place? Imagine I was gonna loan you $100. If I do this, well, there is some risk to me that sometimes you're not gonna pay me back and I'm gonna to wanna to be compensated for that risk. And further, there's an opportunity cost. I could have taken that same $100 and I could have invested it in stocks. I could have invested it in a business. I could have invested it in my own education or just spent it on something that I found fun. And so likewise, by missing out on those opportunities, I'm gonna want some compensation and that compensation is interest. Now there's many different types of interest and the first we'll focus in on is simple interest. If I loan you this $100, when the period of the loan is up, say one year, then you're going to give me back some amount of interest. If the interest rate is say 10% per year, then after one year, you owe me the original $100 and $10 in interest, you owe me 110. If the loan is for two years, you'd owe me the original 100, the 10% interest for the first year, and another 10% interest for the second year, a total of 120. So let's try to come up with a formula for this. Let me establish a few terms. I'm gonna let P denote the initial principal. For example, $100 would be the amount that would be loaned out. And then R stands for the interest rate. So for example, 10% interest in some period like a year. And then what I want to know is the amount A that I'm going to get back. So if I loan out my money, what's the amount that I'm going to receive? So what's a good formula for this? Well, I'm gonna say that the amount A should be equal to the principal plus R times the principal. What's the idea here? Well, the first P stands for if I loan out $100, I better get that $100 back. I better get back my initial principal. And then the RP stands for the interest I get. So for example, if my interest rate is 10%, then I would get 10% of the principal back as interest in addition to the initial principal. This gives me the final answer that I would get back P plus RP. But now I want to imagine that I loan the money out for multiple periods. So for example, if it's 10% per year, maybe I loan it out for two years. And if I loan it out for two years, I get my initial principal P back, I get one year of interest growth, RP back, and then a second year of interest growth, another RP. And so I get P plus RP plus RP. If I lend it out for three periods, I'd have another RP. And in general, I can keep on doing this. And the magic of simple interest here is that every time you go forward another period into the future, you just have the same interest payment, RP over and over again. And that lets us simplify our formula. Our formula can just be P plus T times RP, where T is the number of periods. So for example, if your period is a year and you loan it out for three years, then you'd get your principal plus three times RP. I noticed that there's actually a P in both factors here, so I can just factor it out and I get my final formula for simple interest. Okay, so that's the formula, but let's try to build a bit of an intuition for how quickly this simple interest is going to grow. I've built a simple interest calculator in Maple Learn, and Maple Learn is actually the sponsor for today's video. So down in the description, you can check out this exact workbook where I have my simple interest calculator, my compound interest calculator, and my continuously compounded interest calculator. Maple Learn is a web app that allows you to make these interactive math workbooks where it does all of the computations for you. They're really cool, so check them out. Now, what I've done here is I've made a couple different sliders. So first of all, you can set your initial principal to be whatever you like. For example, the 100 that we started with sounds good. You can similarly slide your interest rate to be whatever you like. I'm gonna set it back to be equal just to 10. And then down here, you get a nice table that tells you the amount A in years 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. 
what you can see is that for simple interest, it just goes up 10 bucks a year. 10, 110, 120, 130, 140, and so on. And on the right, we see a nice little plot of how it grows as well. Pretty simple. And the most important part about simple interest is it doesn't matter what you start this is. I could start this at a thousand, for example. And if I do that, well, it has the same kind of growth pattern, just the same amount. In this case, $100, not $10 now, but the same amount every single year. It's simple interest for a reason. It's pretty simple. Now, simple interest was great, but it has a little bit of a problem. Let's imagine one period has gone by, say, a year. So the $100 is now grown to 110 Simple interest would say that for the second year, you'd only owe me another $10. But that would only be the interest on the original 100 but you now owe me 110. So I want the full 10% on the entire 110. That is, I'm going to want $11 in my second year. So in other words, it would be the initial 100, the first year's interest of 10, and the second year's interest of 11. That's the idea of compounded interest, when there's interest on the interest as well as the original principal. So let's try to write down a formula for that. I again have my principal, my interest rate, and the amount A at the end of my loan. Now, if I only have one period, the formula is actually exactly what we saw before. The principal comes back, and then I also get an interest payment, the R times P. And I'm actually going to go and factor out the P at the beginning this time, so make this P times 1 plus R. And the way I think about this is that the P represents, well, the amount that was lent out. And then the 1 plus R is the multiplicative factor. It says, I need to get back the initial amount, that's the one, and then also the plus R, that's going to be the interest. So if you just take the P and multiply it by one plus R, that's the new amount that's owed. Okay, now imagine I go forward not one, but two periods into the future. Well, one period in the future is this, but two periods in the future, that's how much you owe, and then I need to apply interest to it. In other words, I would multiply by another factor of one plus R. In fact, if I keep doing this, for example, if I go three periods, I'm going to have three factors of 1 plus R multiplied to my initial principal. And the idea always is, no matter what period you're on, if you go one period further into the future, you just multiply what you previously had by 1 plus R. And if I want to do this in generality for a general T, I would say this is P times 1 plus R to the power of T, where T was the number of periods. Now, the fact that the t is now an exponent, previously for simple interest it was a multiplicative factor, now the t is an exponent, that is going to make compound interest grow faster. Let's see why. All right, so back to my Maple workbook. Again, the link is down in the description. And I've made a new calculator for compound interest this time. I've set my principal, I sent my interest rate, and then I've also had this extra factor, which is the number of periods per year, which is currently set to one. Don't worry about this. We're gonna elaborate this a little later on in the video. And what I again get is this nice table of values that tells me the amount A after any number of years. But what's critical here is that it's not just going up by 10 bucks every time. From 100 to 110, yes, that was 10 bucks. But then it goes up $11, and then it goes up $12, and so forth. That is, the value of the interest payment is growing every single year because there's interest on the interest. And this could really matter. So, for example, imagine, I, I hope this won't be the case, but imagine that you had $10,000 on a credit card. And credit cards typically have large interest rates. So let's slide the slider up to something, well, that's a little bit too much. But it's not uncommon to have, for example, 18, 19, 20% on a credit card. Well, if that's the case, your initial $10,000 that you would owe after five years is now almost $25,000. Yes, this is ignoring that for a normal credit card, you have to make a minimum payment every month. However, it shows just the power of compounded interest when it's working against you if you owe for a credit card, where when those interest rates start being high and you have compounding, then you start getting these really large numbers. This is all if it compounds once per year, but the story's gonna get a little bit worse in a moment because we need to talk about what happens when you compound more often than once a year. One problem that occurs when you're trying to compare different types of compounded interest is that the value for the interest rate might seem wildly different. For example, if one person has a loan and they're compounding once a year, the interest rate might look way larger than the interest rate if you're compounding once a month, or once a week, or once a day. 
So in order to try to compare everything on the same terms, we adopt a societal convention that all interest rates will be spoken to, for the most part, as annual interest rates. And then we're going to adapt the formulas when we want to deal with them compounding more frequently than a year. But let me show you what I mean. To deal with this, I want to again have the R and the T that we've seen previously. Except this time I'm going to be explicit that the period is a year here. R is the annual interest rate over a year, and T is representing the number of years, as opposed to a number of periods which might have been less than a year. But then I have to add a new thing. I'm going to let N refer to the number of periods in a year. So for example, if you're compounding monthly, there's 12 months in the year, your N would be 12. So you sort of have this annual interest rate, but then you're going to be compounding it every month, and so you need this value of N equal to 12. Now, the old formula, so I'm, I haven't made adjustments to it yet, the old compounded interest formula was this, P times 1 plus R to the power of T. And basically, this formula is the N equal to 1 case. But I need to see how to adapt this if you have multiple periods in a given year. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to tweak it in two places. I'm going to divide out by an n, and I'm going to multiply an n in two different places. What's going on? Well, the first is, I have instead of r, I have r divided by n. And the idea here is, suppose you have an annual interest rate r of 10%. And what we're doing is, if we compound, say, monthly, where n is equal to 12, you're taking that 10% annual interest rate, you're dividing it by 12, and that's how much interest you're applying on each month. And then in the exponent, where we've got the n times the t, this tells you the total number of periods. n is the periods per year, t is the number of years, so n times t is the total number of periods. And the idea is, I need to take this compounding factor, that 1 plus r divided by n, and I need to multiply it every single period. So for example, if there's n times t periods, you want it to be 1 plus r divided by n to the power of the n times t. So we've modified our previous formula. This then leads to the following question. What n should you choose? What n gives you, for example, the most amount of interest? Let's go back to our Maple Learn workbook here, and I want to increase our crazy credit card example where we started with $10,000 and it was 20% per year. But now I'm going to take the n equal to 1, the number of periods, and I'm going to increase it. Notice that right now, before I increase it, that after 5 years, you'd owe 24,883. If instead of 1, I write 12 here, now it's increased, and after 5 years, you owe almost $27,000. And this shows that when you compound more frequently, the amount of money that you owe goes up at the same interest rate and same initial principle. Well, how bad could this be? Like, for example, what if instead of monthly, you did it daily? So instead of 12, you go 365 here. And actually, this has increased. It's a little more than 27,000, not a little less than 27, but not actually as crazy of an increase from 1 to 12. And in fact, if you wanted to go kind of extreme and say, I don't know, how about 10,000 divisions per year, it actually barely changes the final value after five years. And the idea here is that as you increase the number of periods per year, the amount goes up, but it starts to slow down in how it goes up. So then this sort of begs the question, well, what happens if I increase my frequency of compounding as much as possible? Now, what we saw in our example was that when you made the value of n larger and larger and larger, the amount got bigger and bigger and bigger, but it seemed to be slowing down how fast it was growing. So let's do the following. Let's take n and send it to infinity. We write down the limit as n goes to infinity. This is sort of calculus speak for saying, I'm just going to let my n be as large as possible. So what happens here? What does this converge to if it indeed converges to some number? Well, it does. This limit is a known limit from calculus, and in fact, it has a simple answer. It's just e to the rt. This is an exponential function. This, by the way, is a continuous function. That is, t doesn't have to be an integer number of years. It could be some fraction of a year. This formula just is going to work for any amount of time. And, and that's really nice, because it means that you could just take your money out at any given moment, and this would tell you exactly how much it was. And better yet, this is always the most that you could ever get if you're applying the same interest rate. As in, 
because we're compounding sort of always, if you wish, we're, we're compounding infinitely often, it approaches this limiting value when this is the biggest number that you can have. And because of that fact, it's very common just to deal with all interest in terms of continuously compounded interest. If you know the interest rate R and you want to know how much you're going to have at any given T, just do E to the RT and that'll be your answer. All right, so that brings me to the end of my first video in the financial math series. If you enjoyed the video, please do give it a like for the YouTube algorithm. If you have any questions or comments or what you would like to see next coming up in my financial math series, leave them down in the comments below and we'll do some more math in the next video.